by a number of um, both federal and foundation um, organizations in the United States. I'll be talking about what we call the off-label use of the device. Nothing I'll be speaking about is approved by any regulatory agency, so in the United States that would be the FDA, which means that everything I'll be talking about is research only and has not been proven safe and effective to be done um, in, in the clinic. Um, that said, we um, continue to do research with various um, companies' devices, but the work I'll describe did lead to um, a patent that has been taken in, and the work has actually um, led to a full-scale clinical trial that St. Jude Medical Incorporated is doing in the United States and in Europe. So um, there is an attempt to take the work that I'll describe today and move toward um, seeing if it actually really works and for who um, so it would be available. So what's the motivation? Um, thank you for the very lovely introduction. I always forget that LaSalle, this was his home. Um, and um, I think the entire field is grateful to his um, fantastic work. But for depression, I think our motivation for thinking about um, any kind of invasive treatment really comes from the fact that we don't do that well with the treatments that we have. That the numbers now is that for any treatment, whether it be a psychotherapy like CBT or um, interpersonal psychotherapy or any one of many, many medications that are available for sale, the best numbers is that we get people well, a remission, in only about 40% of cases. And it really doesn't matter what treatment we're talking about. When you put treatments head to head, the numbers are really the same when people do a good job of um, delivering the care. The worst problem is about 10% of people become resistant to treatment over time. Some never get well with any treatment we give them. Some actually deteriorate after having done well in previous episodes with various interventions. And once you fail electroconvulsive therapy, your options are, are extremely limited. The data on transcranial magnetic stimulation is it probably shouldn't be offered to people that have already failed um, several medications. It doesn't tend to work. Um, vagus nerve stimulation has very low response rates. People are looking at immune mediators or ketamine, which can give fantastic um, um, short-term effects but don't last, and you really can't walk around with an infusion of ketamine. So everyone is lamenting the fact that why are we doing so badly? Well, Depression is not a neurological disorder in the classical way we think about neurological disorders. There really has proven to be no clear pathology like we have when you look at the brains of someone with Alzheimer's or Parkinson's disease or Lewy body disease or cortical basal degeneration. I mean, it doesn't have that same pathological hallmark, although there are clearly some abnormalities that I'll discuss. We all lament the fact that patients are all very different, and in psychiatry, it's my impression that everyone celebrates the personal narrative and the variability. If one's looking for a final common pathway, that makes work extremely difficult. And because we don't have biomarkers, we just deal with the variability and do the best we can. The pharmacologists have spent 50 years thinking about monoamines and have had very few new leads. And the animal models we have actually don't even model the very core elements of the disorder. I've never met a guilty rat. And um, the bigger issue, even if you can forego the um, psychological constructs of the illness, there is not a single animal model that can accommodate recurrence, relapse, or resistance. So what do we do? I think this is the context to consider how focal neuromodulation might be seen as a strategy. And I think the facilitators of this have been um, fourfold, actually really threefold. I think if there had not been 85,000 cases of movement disorder, various movement disorder, DBS surgeries over the last 20, 25 years, we would never have dared and no one would have dared to move in this direction. So I think the advances in stereotactic neurosurgery more broadly have made this at least a possibility. Like I said, the experience in other neurological diseases, 
Um, and I think most critically has been the availability and the studies done with structural and functional imaging. And that certainly has been um, what was my motivation um, with my colleagues in Toronto. So how do we think about how we might leverage what's known in movement disorder to studies in depression to move in this direction? Well, I think we you know when we think about movement disorder and for the psychiatrist, I mean, it's a multi-symptom complex or syndrome. There's tremor, rigidity, slowed movement, a problem with gait. As many of you know, there's affect lability, there's cognitive impairments. It is not just a motor disorder, but it was the identification that the Nigra degeneration tracked with dopamine, the fact that dopamine had um, an organization in the brain and that the Nigra projected to the um, striatum. And that actually drove the development of DOPA replacement in the 60s. Um, but it was really starting to understand how chemistry existed in circuits and how the wiring diagram of the extrapyramidal motor system was put together. And that actually led back to thinking about how did lesions, because in the pre-pharmacologic era, surgeons even before any kind of real imaging as contemporary neuroscience understands it, surgeons were very good at putting lesions in the thalamus and alleviating tremor. And it wasn't until the circuit physiology was deconstructed that why lesions in very strategic locations in the extrapyramidal motor system might alleviate these symptoms. I think that really brought many things to bear. And it's in that context that as many of the neurosurgeons knew and did, as one was recording and moving toward placement of an ablative lesion in the thalamus, one would make electrophysiological recordings and do micro stimulation at high frequency to kind of know when, when you're in the right spot. And it was um, Louis Benebig that um, at least is credited um, with the first systematic um, um, use of deep brain stimulation in this context. So one can see that one needs to know where, one needs to know the organization, and then one can start to think about what would be a putative target. But I do want to bring up for thought, um, and I think this is true when we think about treatment of um, depression or any of the um, major um, psychiatric disorders, is that we expect our treatments to target the whole syndrome, and the syndrome is defined by a set of rules that I don't know, some people in some room somewhere agree to agree on. And even in movement disorder, you target with, um, whether it be globus pallidus or subthalamic nucleus, DBS, dopa responsive symptoms. You don't get any change in the cognitive or the affective symptoms. If anything, you might make them worse. But that you don't, you need to consider that differential targets may have primary impacts on different symptoms. And I want everyone to keep that in mind as we talk about depression. Now, the other thing that I think we want to learn from the lead that movement disorder has for depression, that if we were ever to actually get a spot that we thought would be reasonable, we're going to need to actually learn a lot about it. And in movement disorder, they have improved their targeting by use of electrophysiology. Um, there are people who believe that it's precision of, of knowing the unit activity in the brain. There are some people who believe, no, if I just have better imaging, I can get um, more precise modeling with gray and white matter targeting at higher resolution. There are people who believe that you can model the fibers themselves and consider the electrical modeling of the fields of tissue activated and actually compare the location of where an electrode is to the adjacent gray and white matter and the direction in which fibers are carrying on the current. There's focus um, on the oscillations and network oscillations um, more generally. Um, and that all of these can then lead to a reverse translation approach to where once one has the network in mind, one can dissect it kind of pathway by pathway to actually um, understand what one did. So with that as an introduction, how do we approach depression? Well, when I got into this business, um, before many of you were born, um, which is always really horrifying, um, the idea about depression was that 
was in the time, and in 1987, this was right after the publication of DeLong, Strick, and Alexander's work on um, cortical striatal loops. And at that point in time, um, we were all actually in the same institution at Johns Hopkins. We wanted to look at depression and consider that depression was a mood disorder with cognitive, motor, and circadian dysregulation. And that if it behaved like other neurological disorders, it could be dissected into its component parts. And there were certainly models at the time that actually suggested at the level of frontal striatal systems that one could start to deconstruct um, the disorder that way. So the thought was symptoms would map to subcircuits and treatments would impact some or all of those subcircuits. So the steps were taken in two directions. Imaging, um, structural imaging was newly in place. Bob Robinson had systematically described patients that had depression after stroke, had looked to systematically catalog, catalog what lesion location of a stroke was associated with the development of post-stroke depression, and the left prefrontal cortex and the left caudate led the way, although what was always lost in those early studies was the fact that nearly a third of the lesions were actually in parietal cortex and not necessarily on the left side. So there was already a suggestion from the lesion literature that you could actually interrupt some system in the brain at very um, disparate locations. This was not just about frontal striatal circuits, but that was sort of lost because it was a dominant lesions in the prefrontal cortex and caudate. Um, when Drevet started to look at MRI scans in patients who had primary depression and described low volume with um, standard volumetric analyses in the ventral medial frontal cortex in the subcolossal region, this was associated with abnormalities in glia in postmortem depressed brains in the same area. And similarly, there was data suggesting that particularly with untreated depression, that there was atrophy of the hippocampus. Again, a finding that went very nicely with the leading theories about stress that were being studied um, in various animal models. The alternative approach was to look at function and the availability of glucose metabolic or blood flow PET um, and SPECT um, and later EEG. Our work um, looked at neuro neurological models of depression starting with Parkinson's disease, but also Huntington's and patients with these focal caudate strokes. And whether it was neurological depression, unipolar depressed patients, bipolar depressed patients, experiments over time with glucose metabolism comparing depressed to non-depressed cohorts of patients identified not just left-sided, but bilateral frontal, anterior cingulate, and even parietal hypometabolism really mapping onto what had been seen in the original lesion work. So if one sort of thinks about what was known at that time, it seemed as though there were multiple nodes, frontal, striatal, cingulate, hippocampus, um, and that there started to be putative elements of some kind of organized system. The problem is, is that early on it became very clear that there were some contradictions. In my lab, actually in two cities, in two countries, um, that, that we were always seeing this hypofrontal pattern. We tended to study people that were hospitalized, um, tertiary care clinics, referral clinics. And um, when we um, moved, and when I moved to Toronto from Texas, we saw our first group of patients who weren't hypofrontal, they were hyperfrontal, comparably recruited, similarly, similar severity of depression, no comorbidity. And this was in keeping with actually a study that um, what had, was well in the literature, but not the common finding. Again, ventral prefrontal hypermetabolism, similar pattern, but also increased metabolism in the amygdala and the thalamus. And that was a study that, that um, Wayne Drevitz published. So frontal lobe was involved, even though it was the best replicated finding, tracking with severity of depression symptoms, you really couldn't have a unified theory of any of this data if one considered that the frontal lobe was the primary problem, I mean, totally unreconcilable. And I think that in retrospect, this was the earliest clue that we really, whether we thought we were or not, we were picking up 
subtype differences and actually had to be figuring out what was the frontal lobe following. So a revision of the hypothesis that this is sort of a dysfunction in a systematic way of the frontal striatal system is that maybe we ought to think about a network that we haven't quite characterized yet and with some initiating trigger also not necessarily characterized that one starts to have symptoms. For some people it's just sort of having a bad day and one can actually re-regulate and correct the adaptive responses that go and the brain responses that go with that negative trigger. But as um, a sustained stress may be um, involved, that the brain just doesn't really lie there and take it. It starts to make adaptive maneuvers. And those adaptive changes are going to be the net sum of whatever the original insult is, what your past history, what your genetics, what your early experiences, including a past depression, might be in terms of how you might try to self-regulate. And of those in the audience uh, that do cognitive therapy, I mean, what do, what do you do when you actually initiate helping a patient to identify what are those triggers that sent them off? Because once things get into the habit circuit, they don't even recognize anymore what their adaptive responses are. And so if we sort of see that illness generally thought of is failure to self-correct, then maybe what we want to do is actually optimize recovery by getting a treatment that will actually correct um, the already failed adaptive strategy. So the next step in trying to define the network that might be appropriate for brain stimulation is to consider what do we know about treatments that do work and where do they work. And this is just a schematic that attempts to organize in the boxes and the colors um, behaviors and brain areas that have shown an abnormality or a change in a variety of both studies of depression and studies in cognitive and affective neuroscience of provoking or studying specific um, behaviors. But importantly, what you see with um, successful response to different medications, mostly serotonin reuptake inhibitors, We've done this experiment with fluoxetine, peroxetine, and venlafaxine. There's a common signal change across all of the treatments. It's downregulation of limbic areas, area 25, so subcolossal cingulate and insula, as well as um, increases in frontal cortex. And you know the interpretation was that really changing limbic tone, you're, you're altering emotional reactivity, and you're getting sort of secondary changes in cortex. And again, you know, we can look at side effect profiles, we can see the nature of how patients describe change in their um, negative symptoms. On the other hand, um, one can use cognitive behavioral therapy, and we've done this now in two separate cohorts of patients. What was quite different in the cognitive therapy response wasn't an increase in frontal cortex, but actually a decrease in frontal cortex. And in the first study, it was only a change in frontal cortex, and that was sort of in keeping with how everyone thought about mechanism of CBT. You actually um, change um, emotional awareness. You um, help patients to decrease ruminative thought, getting changes in ventral lateral prefrontal cortex, and down-regulating down the activity has some intuitive um, attractiveness. And actually, over time, a second experiment actually found that Area 25 was also involved, except the change in the resting state from going from sick to well with 16 weeks of cognitive therapy was actually increasing activity in Area 25. And in some ways, when one thinks about what you need to learn in CBT, it's actually to recognize your emotional state and actually work with it. And so I think, again, the idea that there are reciprocal relationships between frontal cortex and these limbic areas, I think, is the take-home message from this series of studies. But I think another way to look at this is, is to say, this is a big landscape. This is a lot of regions. So the question is, is, does any one node or any one compartment or any one behavior actually stand out? Well, I think this kind of gets us back to kind of personal philosophy, if you will, about what is the problem in major depression. You know, in the experimental world, people can tackle the cognitions, people can tackle the anhedonia, 
to actually focus on the failure to experience pleasure, I would say that actually it's tolerable to actually not feel pleasure. It is not tolerable to actually experience psychic pain that is pervasive and non-remitting. And I think the historical record going back to the time of Hippocrates is about that despondency. And I think for anyone who has not had a major depression, and I have not, that the, the unworldly quality of the mental pain is something that I think unless you've experienced, one can't know what that's actually like except to be an empathetic um, physician as one listens to it. These descriptions of positive anguish, of mental pain, of an immobilization is something that is actually not a normal experience. And I think that really the hypothesis is what we need to be getting at is what is actually driving that set of symptoms because perhaps the negative mood is what secondarily drives this other series of reactive and adaptive processes. So to try to isolate negative mood, first we try to do it by the recovery pattern of you know, the frontal increase and the, sub and the limbic decreases and try to deconstruct which part was going with the mood part. And that didn't go very well because the whole syndrome seemed to track with the relationship of these two regions. And so we did an experiment where we just provoked healthy volunteers to at least try to get a handle on the healthy experience of an intense, acute negative event. And we didn't do much better in terms of deconstructing or separating the interaction between area 25 and frontal cortex, that the magnitude of how sad you felt over five minutes thinking about a personal negative event was strongly correlated with increases in 25 and decreases in frontal cortex. And you'll see that recovery over six weeks, change in mood over six minutes, is actually the identical pattern except in reverse. These are glucose scans, these are blood flow scans, and the patterns are superimposable. So we actually have this reciprocity and we're starting to get at a subset of regions that seem to be most critical. And we started to actually pay a little more attention to the subcolossal cingulate because not only did it activate in various experiments um, with sad memory, but it will activate and tracks with the negative experience when people are exposed to the tryptophan depletion protocol. It's an area in monkeys that actually tracks with stress and cortisol levels in experiments um, such as a human intruder task. It's the area that Drevitz and Onger um, described as the area of focal atrophy. This would be the equivalent um, for anyone who studies um, rodents of infralimbic cortex, where infralimbic um, actually um, cortex is associated with loss of spines and dendrites. So changes in information processing with chronic exposures to stress. This area has anatomical abnormalities that distinguish healthy people who carry the SS form of the serotonin transporter allele versus the LL, which has been linked to early trauma and um, later depression. And as you can see, whether it was with SSRIs, venlafaxine, even placebo medication, um, prefrontal transcranial magnetic stimulation, ECT, or vagus nerve stimulation, this region in people who get well over time to whichever treatment downregulates in, um, in studies that use blood flow or metabolism. This area seems to be high in more severely ill depressed patients and it predicts response to sleep deprivation, cingulotomy, and even with resting state fMRI is activated in the so-called default mode, meaning that it actually sort of hijacks what you do when you're doing nothing. So our hypothesis was that in treatment resistant depression, the system is dysregulated, that perhaps the problem is subcolossal cingulate connectivity and maybe if you can't talk it well or drug it down or shock it down, maybe you could modulate it strategically if you could get at it. So when you think about it, um, we had a discussion and some pictures of kind of circuits. We've talked about different areas of the brain. 
What is actually known about Area 25? I mean, Area 25, it sounds like, you know, a landing spot in, you know, New Mexico. Um, it's become sort of a catchphrase. It's sort of been taken over as, this is really the subcolossal cingulate, which is made up of Area 25, Area 32. It's a granular cortex. It's unusual and very old cortex. It's not like prefrontal cortex. So it has qualities that are more limbic than um, neocortical. But it has a very striking pattern of connections. And this is all work that was derived from track tracing studies in um, non-human primates. It has direct connections to the brainstem, to the periaqueductal gray, and to the dorsal raphe. It has reciprocal connections, extremely strong to the amygdala. It actually is one of the strongest reciprocal connections of the basal lateral amygdala. It receives information from the ventral <coughs> hippocampus, particularly CA1, in, a uni, um, in, a, in only a single direction. It talks to other areas of the cingulum bundle, and it talks directly to the medial hypothalamus. So it actually, just by virtue of its structural connections, sits in position to actually impact all of the circadian, interoceptive, and, and memory elements that we associate with the disorder. The other thing about it, back to um, our friend, the basal ganglia system, it has a direct connection to the um, shell of the nucleus accumbens. And so it is strategically involved in aspects of motivation and drive that we associate with the anhedonia. And I think that a very, very important and in some ways until recently overlooked um, connection is its direct connections to the thalamus, the ultimate filter and gating system that we have. And um, I draw your attention to Helen Barbus' work and the connections of different aspects of frontal cortex, including the cingulate, the posterior orbital frontal cortex, and area 25. And in a new paper that just came out last week on the amygdala, the connections to the thalamic reticular nucleus and its role as actually a lateral inhibitory filter to the dorsal medial thalamus. So in fact, area 25 can actually, through lateral inhibition through the TRN, can actually lock out sensory information from other sources. Mm -hmm. When you think about what depressed patients describe, I can't get outside of myself to pay attention to you, to pay attention to anything. That the idea that the, that the thalamus is actually acting as a roadblock is extremely attractive. So if we go back to our hypothesis, maybe what we're seeing is that a negative event sets off the subcolossal cingulate plus system. And if you don't have a appropriate cortical response to that system, you may be in big trouble. And that our hypothesis is that DBS targets the local network, assuming that there's minimal adaptive changes or feedback downstream. So what we proposed was that by targeting this region directly, again, starting from this very large blob that you could see on the PET scan, and obviously for the neurosurgeons, I mean, DBS electrode is certainly much smaller than this blob, but one can actually make a fairly strategic and straightforward plan, surgical plan, to target this area which sits nicely right in front of the head of the caudate, um, in the subcolossal zone, there's a nice inferior landmark um, of the inferior sulcus, and with knowledge of the connections, really to maintain and stay very midline. Because if one targeted the old school sub, you know, subcaudate tractotomy, which might have been one approach, because at the time, the going hypothesis was that ablation <coughs> equaled stimulation. So why not go to an area that people had ablated before and stimulate there? But in fact, knowledge of the connections predicted that if one went very lateral here, you would be in the wrong system and would not get at the strategic connections to hypothalamus, brainstem, if one moved too laterally. So we moved to actually um, start a study. And I think it's important to consider, you know, theory is good, data is better, but at some point, 
one is going to make a decision about who would you think to offer a neurosurgical procedure to. And I think that it's important to recognize that people that have failed multiple medications, including ECT, are at the end of the line. Most of them aren't working. Most of them aren't involved in their families. And William Styron, famous writer, wrote about his own depression quite eloquently. And I think what's really important to remember about this quote is this is a man that actually on medication recovered. So this state is a state that every seriously depressed patient knows. The difference is what is that like to be in that state and not be able to get out? The idea that no remedy will come, the cruel component of depression, probably because of the changes in the hippocampus, you can't project yourself into the future. You can't use your past experience to remember what it was like to be well, to actually help yourself to imagine a different space. So you're in this sort of sustained purgatory. And this was really the group of patients that we were targeting. Major depressive disorder, we wanted people with no psychiatric comorbidities. And this is not easy because many patients who have treatment-resistant depression, because there isn't a biological screening tool, often have comorbid personality disorders, some of which actually develops as a result of the unrelenting depression, but not always. Um, we wanted people who were unlikely to get better spontaneously, so minimum duration of the current episode of a year. We wanted them to be um, severe, so minimum Hamilton 17 score of 20. They couldn't be working, so these were people that were all um, functionally disabled and in Toronto um, on disability, and um, that they had had adequate trials of at least four um, treatments, including an evidence-based psychotherapy and ECT. So the procedure is very straightforward, Lexel frame, everybody's seen the devices. Um, the target is in the subclosal cingulate, and as you can see with this um, simulation, um, which we use to match the anatomy to electrophysiology to actually confirm that we're in the white matter or where the white matter is relative to the gray matter in this sort of sandwich of the subcolossal cingulate. Patients are awake. We do MRI-based targeting. We do the microelectro verification. We do behavioral testing with macrostimulation um, with an awake patient in the operating room. So as many people have read, the first um, study, which is now, you know, so long ago, I mean, the first patient was operated on in 2003. Um, we operated on six patients. Average illness duration, we wanted a year. These patients were on average in episode five years. Um, average number of medications failed, I think, was 17. They um, were treated for six months with open label DBS. We had no idea what would happen, so we didn't do a sham control because we didn't know if there would be immediate effects, side effects, and decided we would just treat this as a safety experiment. But um, we, were, we were pleased and surprised to see that at the end of six months that four of the six patients were not just better, um, they were nearly well. The drop in the Hamilton was down to a Hamilton, I think, on average of 10. Um, better news um, was that the scan pattern, and in this group, they had overactive um, cingulate, but also abnormalities in prefrontal cortex and in subcortical areas, that with um, six months of chronic stimulation, that we actually down-regulated and actually had support for our initial hypothesis. I think what is interesting about this scan, and I just pointed out here as we go to the next part of the talk, is the fact that there, the predominant change in the brain was decrease in blood flow, not increase in blood flow. The leading theory at the time was that DBS induced depolarization block. You're going at 130 hertz. If you talk to any card-carrying basic scientists, they kind of go, you're, you're not driving information in the brain, you're blocking information in the brain, because the brain doesn't go at 130 hertz. Neurons don't fire at 130 hertz. On the other hand, that if one looks very carefully in animals at the initial signal, you actually will increase unit firing and then get block, so that the sustained effect over time seems to be a decrease in activity, at least a decrease in blood flow.
What I think is interesting about the pattern is because we're in the white matter, not in the gray matter, anywhere that is targeted by those white matter tracts appears to have a decrease in blood flow. Any place that has a transsynaptic change, you got an increase in blood flow. So it's, a, it's interesting to be thinking about the nature of where these PET scan changes are relative to the nature of this circuit, and I'm gonna talk about that further. But this prompted us to extend our study from six patients to 20 to continue. These patients are on chronic stimulation. This isn't stimulating and then you rest. This is on all the time, every day, 24-7, 130 hertz at about um, four to six um, my, um, milliamps. And as you can see in these 20 patients, there's a, a early drop in the Hamilton, and pretty much if you got better, you stayed better. About 60% responders pretty much maintained over the year. And we published last year the long-term um, outcome on the available patients. And, and the bottom line, if you got better, you stayed better. There weren't late developing side effects. I think importantly, there was not tachyphylaxis. We looked at cognitive functioning with formal neuropsych testing to make sure we hadn't, there wasn't a price you paid to have this mood improvement. Batteries were lasting, at least in that first group, um, with a constant voltage device about four and a half years. And it became very clear that when a battery was depleted, you lost the effect so that this was not something that you corrected over time. So the next steps were, let's do it again. Maybe we need to look at other subgroups, need to really understand the duration of the effect. Um, is there tachyphylaxis? What happens if you formally turn it off? You need to have really placebo-controlled trials, which industry is the right place to do that. And one has to consider other plausible targets. Our strategy was, you know, we're not ready to move to other targets. We need to figure out what we're doing with what we're doing. To know why didn't everyone get well? You know, when you go from people not getting better at all to having 60% of people well, the next question is, is, well, what happened to those other 40%? And the issue is, is it about placement? Is it about dosing? Is there something about the phenotype that we might um, know before we even select and operate on a patient? And then we can deal with comparing different targets and side effects. I think importantly, now we start to have a platform con for considering um, reverse translation and actually understanding what we actually really did. So at Emory, we um, designed a one-month single-blind sham-controlled study. And instead of only limiting it to major depression, we expanded it to bipolar II depression. For the psychiatrists, um, you know, there's lots of thinking about is anybody with recurrent depression part of the bipolar spectrum? I'm not going there, I'm a neurologist, so I will um, not, not get into that discussion. But we do know that bipolar II depression is currently defined, does notoriously badly on medication, and um, can actually have manic switches. And so the issue was to try to study that group as well. Similarly ill patients to the group we did in Toronto, and um, as you can see, um, with 10 unipolar and seven bipolar patients. It was hard to find bipolar patients that met the one year duration requirement. That was the biggest problem for the bipolars um, that um, made it them slower to recruit. The good news was that we got um, a similar um, effect as we saw in Toronto. Um, the six month um, effects was a little lower, but and at a year, it didn't change much, but by two years, and now this is all the patients, the paper which was published two months ago um, of the available 12 at two years when the paper was published was a 90% two-year response rate, but it's actually a more reasonable 65% response rate. At any point in time, patients bounce around a little bit. Do they meet the 50% drop? But for all intents and purposes, patients um, sustained over time with the chronic stimulation, actually, if they do well, they continue to do well. The good news was that there was no difference on any metric we looked at between the bipolar patients and the unipolar patients. And importantly, we could not induce um, mania or hypomania even when we turned up the current. And this is very different from what's described with nucleus accumbens stim, where even with acute testing, you invariably can actually drive and induce um, an elation or a hypomanic state that then um, goes away after you turn it off.
Similar time course to Toronto, we saw a modest um, but clinically not significant sham effect. And when we looked at the sham effect at one month, it seemed to track with those patients that had been exposed to acute stimulation in the operating room, which I'll talk about in a minute. And if you achieved um, remission, we weren't seeing spontaneous relapses. And there is an impression that patients seem to be more resilient to stress in their environment. They have full dynamic range of negative and positive emotions. Many of them comment as very different from medication because they don't have blunting of emotional, of their emotional experience. Um, but if something goes wrong, they just seem to be able to cope with it a little better. They, they um, can be down and then don't seem to get stuck. We started a blinded discontinuation at six months and promptly start, stopped after three patients because we got a predictable deterioration in anywhere from four days to two to three weeks. And when we turned it back on after they had gotten ill, it actually took um, longer than we expected from our experience with battery depletions to get better. And we thought for safety reasons that it was consistent what we had observed with battery replacements in Toronto, and we didn't continue. I think that what's interesting about this is it implies that despite this level of recovery, there's not plasticity in the system. It's not like dystonia where batteries can wear out in patients who have recovered from dystonia, and um, they, um, their, their dystonia doesn't return. Um, the rate of de deterioration may actually vary with different brain targets, and so that's going to be something important to see. But I think in an optimistic way, I think the fact that you turn it off and you don't get return of symptoms um, for several weeks, and it tends to not start with intense negative mood. It tends to be slowed thinking. It tends to be lack of initiative. Supports that maybe you could cycle the stimulation and actually come up with a more physiologic type of delivery. There have been other treatments, other targets, um, published studies on the ventral capsule, ventral striatum, which is also the target for OCD. Um, in Germany, um, targeting the nucleus accumbens, which um, the Dutch group um, um, has also targeted, and I understand is also doing for depression. Um, there have been case reports on the lateral habenula, um, the thalamic, inferior thalamic peduncle, um, and even the medial forebrain bundle with the idea to drive monoamines quite directly that um, work is not yet published. I think overall everyone, when you kind of listen and look at if patients continue, that everybody kind of gets better. So this idea that are we in the same circuit and you can kind of stimulate everywhere is something to consider. But I want to kind of, you know, spend the time for the last part of the talk on the idea of what have we learned and can we actually go back to the circuit to understand something about why everyone doesn't get well. Because I think that if in fact the logic is correct and the patient selection is correct, there should be an explanation for why we don't do as well as we expect or why actually it takes longer to get better than um, in some patients than others. So the first obvious approach is to blame it on the surgeons, meaning they put it in the wrong place. And Clement Hamani, one of the surgeons in Toronto, looked at the placement of the active contacts in the first Toronto group of 20 and found that there's a cloud of where the placement is. For those of you that aren't surgeons, when you, um, even though this is a very small wire, one needs to be quite strategic about how one places it, that surgical precision, there can be vessels, there can be sinuses, there can be things in the way that can make exactly how you might want to place the electrode not be how the electrode is placed. Sometimes the ventricle can displace the wire as it goes in. So there are all kinds of technical things that can happen. But when it came down to it, just looking at where the electrode was and where the active contacts were, this was not the explanation. And Clement went on to actually set up an animal model of this that actually supported this. And what was important about the animal model is that infralimbic white matter DBS and measuring the four swim test as a readout of an acute antidepressant effect was um, seen. But if you just ablated this area, you didn't get an antidepressant effect with this test model. 
But if you ablated with imitinic acid, which actually spares the fibers in the region, and then applied stimulation, you got the antidepressant effect again, which implied that it's the fibers of passage that you need to deal with. And it really, after all is said and done, has nothing to do with the cingulate itself at all, or at least not exclusively. And we kind of knew that because we even knew in that first PET study that everybody had down regulation at the target. We didn't miss turning down cingulate activity, but it really was about the difference between responders and non-responders had to do with remote effects. And, e and we didn't really pay a lot of attention to this because we had so few non-responders that we didn't feel confident about the PET results. But I think, you know, in retrospect, we were given a very important clue on the medial frontal cortex even at that time. And we started to look at what would link the location of the blobs with the concept of the circuits. Well, tools were developing where we could actually look at the white matter tracks themselves. We depended on them indirectly. Now we could actually measure them directly and actually see what is impacted in terms of the actual connections using diffusion imaging to actually map out the um, putative circuit that we're impacting. And that one can take and simulate, and this is actually a CT scan superimposed on a patient's pre-op MRI, and so you can see the four available contacts for stimulation. If you model the tractography map of one contact versus another, one can start to see that stimulation in one location compared to adjacent contact will actually have impact on different circuits. And we took that by actually going back to something we'd observed in the operating room. So when we did our original testing, I mean, one of the things that has been certainly um, interesting to many people is we were very surprised that when we started to turn on the current at certain contacts and not all contacts and not all currents, that patients would suddenly spontaneously describe changes in how they felt. The um, narratives were quite stunning. One patient described the vortex being gone, always felt that they were in the sort of the vortex that was pulling them, like they were going to drown, and that sensation went away. You had patients commonly describe feeling lighter, feeling less heavy. Um, some patients describing they felt more connected to me, to the people in the operating room. That the, the patients even say, asked if we turn the lights on in the room. They sort of felt more attentive and actually the room looked brighter. We thought this was interesting. We thought we could just repeat it outside the operating room and we didn't know if it was particularly helpful. But we actually saw that patients who had that initial effect actually got better faster. And so that it might have actually been something that was an indicator of where we should be stimulating. And so in our new study, when we started our study in Atlanta, we actually started to catalog the spontaneous self-reports. And we also um, were measuring with every contact change, um, changes in the positive and negative affective scale on the PANIS. Um, that will give us an indicator of changes in positive emotion and changes in negative emotion. And what we did is, on those contacts where a patient had a change in emotional self-report, we compared the track map on that location, on their diffusion tensor imaging, to the contact right before. And for each patient who had this effect, could compare a contact that gave the behavioral effect versus one that didn't, and could actually map what were the important tracks that went with that emotional difference change. And we could also see that the change wasn't increasing positive mood, it was actually decreasing negative mood. And you needed to reach the medial frontal tracts in order to engage that effect. We had actually a proof of principle example of this. We had um, a young woman who um, was the absolute perfect candidate by every criteria and all of our collective experience. And this was actually one where it turned out the surgeon probably went a little shallow. And over um, six months, she had about a 30% change in her Hamilton. 
but at the end of six months kind of was quite demoralized and says, you know, I was just trying so hard for this to work, but I still have this intense kind of mental pain and noise. And at this point, we had done so much work with the tractography that when we looked at the electrode placement, looked at our track maps, realized that actually we were not engaged in this medial frontal system, and she agreed to be re-implanted. And so she was re-implanted. You can see the second um, um, targeting. We now have several contacts that are actually in this medial frontal bundle. These are actually modeled volume of tissue activated by um, um, Cameron McIntyre's group at Cleveland Clinic. And actually, we could model um, precisely what had we gained in terms of what track system we were in. With surgery one, we'd done well to get to the thalamus, to the subcortical areas. We'd certainly hit our target area and had gotten up the cingulum bundle, but it wasn't until we actually did and moved the contact, the active contacts were actually engaging this medial frontal system. We had another case that I took out just in retrospect in Toronto, no tractography, where the woman didn't originally qualify. I brought this because cingulotomy is certainly a technique that's used um, for um, intractable depression, intractable OCD, intractable pain. Again, um, I know with Dr. Petrovic's work, you know, the metaphor of psychic pain versus um, physical pain, I think is, as he um, talks about extensively, is, is really a critical metaphor. And um, when, when th this woman actually did well with cingulotomy for about four months and then relapsed, and the surgical team did not feel it was appropriate to enlarge the lesion, and so we did her um, not part of the study, but actually implanted um, stimulator as we had done for the other group. And she had a rapid improvement and has continued to be well. And to try to understand that, because one would have thought that if one interrupted the cingulum bundle, that it should be actually doing something in terms of a in terms of the cingulum bundle connections between the dorsal cingulate and the subcolosal cingulate. But in fact, when you consider this is just track maps um, in a normal volunteer, that the cingulum bundles connection are probably impacting less the subcolosal fibers and are probably having a bigger impact on a cortical disconnection. When you think about cingulotomy, patients will say, I still have the pain, but it just doesn't bother me as much. I think if one believes that the driver of this is subcolossal and periacuductal gray, hypothalamus, and really brainstem systems, that system was still on automatic pilot, and it wasn't until you'd actually regulated it directly that the patient improved. So we have evidence that this may be the case. We're starting to develop predictive biomarkers of variable response. Um, just um, recently, um, a paper we have on EEG shows that actually people are doing well at six months versus not actually, oop, sorry, I'm supposed to be somewhere, huh? Okay, at my lab meeting. That um, you actually can see in the theta range that actually those people that get better start with lower frontal theta and then increase their frontal theta, whereas those that do poorly actually start high and go in the opposite direction. So the state of the network to start is probably not insignificant, that this is not a generic, you know, blast it, shock it, reboot it as a way to think about it. And we've started to actually now um, get to looking at the pet changes over time. And I think this idea that that immediate effect in the operating room is not just amusing, interesting, I'm actually starting to think that it is fundamentally the initiation that you actually are releasing the system from whatever is holding it. That here at the target, here's the pre-surgical PET baseline in that region. It actually is already at its maximum drop at the one month placebo mark. So patients were exposed in the operating room, had this release phenomena, and even though they're ill again a month later, that area 25 is actually staying in its new position and is not further decreased over the course of the study. Um, similarly, the anterior insula, an area that's connected and is part of this interoceptive angst, particularly the right anterior insula, this region, it also already is showing down regulation and blood flow that um, is variable 
um, at six months. Um, and I think that's an interesting um, finding that we'll need to pursue further. Seeing changes in the thalamus and the hypothalamus, those seem to be changed only with sustained chronic stimulation. And what's really fascinating about the thalamus, and I'm now very focused on the thalamus because of Helen Barbus's recent paper, but actually it is not changed at the um, placebo period and decreases activity even early before there's really a clinical improvement. And so I think the idea that the filtering system, the gating system of the brain may be driving this and that really this is a subcortical phenomenon, not a, a cortical phenomenon, it's something to consider. We're trying to look at baseline patterns of prediction and here's our friend in the medial frontal cortex that seems to be higher as a function of actually patients doing less well. So I think that as we look at this data over time, we're going to start to actually realize that there's dyssynchrony within this system in ways that are not actually absolutely intuitive. And I think we're going to have to deal with that slowly but surely. And similarly, we've even have data on resting bold fMRI, looking specifically at what is the functional connectivity, not of any network, but of those regions that speak directly to Area 25. And we start to see that as a function of how patients do, all the frontal cortex areas, the responders actually have a, a, um, a less normal pattern in terms of how 25 is connected to that region. Patients who get better slower actually are more like healthy people in terms of their connectivity pattern. And one implication is that you know, maybe targeting this area it's not really helpful for them because that actually system isn't particularly abnormal. On the other hand, you get the, the flip side of abnormality when you get into subcortical and limbic areas. I've underlined and just showed two regions in each kind of domain um, because the patterns are all very similar, that the responders actually are underconnected when they should be connected. So we're starting to try to use these various approaches to um, reach a point where we actually do scans to help define what is the nature of the brain of the patient, even if they meet criteria, use the imaging to guide where we place, follow what we do, have better precision, and even now are starting to do studies of interoperative fuel potential to actually watch in real time what the electrophysiological changes are. So for the last minute, I just want to get back to the patient. And I think that, you know, these patients being this profoundly ill for so long, the issue is, is we need to kind of consider more than just um, the physiology and the biology, although without that, I think we're, we're doomed. But what's very, very interesting is that some patients, like I said, and we have reason to believe that their biology may start different, and we have to be more strategic in terms of our placement and understanding what we do to them. But there are people who seem to get better, but it takes them longer. And there are patients who get better more rapidly. And instead of just thinking about the biology, it may be that part of what we're seeing in that baseline biology actually reflects who they are as people without actually the illness. You know, we, we have this expectation that we're going to change all of them. Well, maybe actually we return them to the chaotic person that they used to be with um, the length of time that um, illness has, has brought to bear on their condition. And I think this is true in movement disorder, in epilepsy. We all talk about the nature of forced normalization, the idea that you, know, you have to come to grips with what it is to be well after one has been unwell and lives a life that is not of your choosing and wouldn't um, be how you would um, request your situation, but you do reach an equilibrium when one's been chronically ill. Patients expect to be better fast, and in fact, you get, it takes time. You almost, in some ways, I tell patients, you have to kind of learn what it is to have a bad day, because if you've been dead, you actually have, and have had no dynamic range, you have to actually relearn that feeling sad is meaningful and doesn't mean you're relapsing. Um, patients have an expectation that they're never gonna have a bad day again, 
and they need to understand that that is true. And I think that what's most fascinating, and I think there really is a biology, is when you are ill, can't imagine yourself well, can't project your past to your future, and suddenly you're released from that, all you want at that moment in time is just make the pain go away. And as soon as it's gone, patients very rapidly forget what it was actually like. And now they are very focused on, gee, I didn't realize what a mess my family was. I didn't realize all the things I haven't done. I have a lot of catching up to do. And now they're actually focused on the trials and tribulations of everyday life. And whereas at first they wanted the primary symptoms to go away, now they have new priorities that actually impact all of our measurement scales. So you can have patients that actually look fantastic. They are unrecognizable, who still score high on a Hamilton, and it's being driven by factors that have nothing to do with what drove their score when you met them. And this is a incredibly interesting but maddening situation, and I think that we are actually underrepresenting what we actually do to patients and need to develop some real new metrics. So I'll just end with the idea is this patient, I think, describes what we actually do. I think that we are resetting the system when we get into the strategic correct, correct location in that operating room. That heaviness, the brake comes off. But just like a car, when the brake is released, just because it has the capacity to move, the car isn't going to move unless you drive. And what the patients do describe is that instead of not being able to know where I am with no sense of direction in this hole with no light and I have no idea where I am or how I'm going to get out of here, they actually begin to perceive that they're not all the way where they want to be, but now they actually can participate in their own recovery. And I think this is what may be part of plasticity. This may be late developing effects and other systems in the brain. Um, whether or not doing adjunctive rehabilitation is necessary, I think, like any treatment, um, strategies to actually use your brain now that it's working, um, everybody needs a coach. And this is just quoting that one woman who um, I showed you um, was re-implanted. I think she kind of said it best, that what she really noticed was that the DBS doesn't make it easy, it just makes it possible. And so now when she goes to do something, her efforts have impact. And I think you know, we will spend our time now how to optimize the treatment, how to facilitate and um, develop adjunct treatments to um, optimize this. So I'll just introduce my team. Um, I know some of you um, know Andres Lozano and Sid Kennedy. This is Clement Hamani and um, Zindel Siegel, who I'm um, the cognitive behavioral therapist I did all of our past work with. And this is um, the team, Bob Gross and Paul Holzheimer um, at Emory and the rest of my imaging lab. You can see it takes a lot of people to try to organize these various mechanistic and treatment plans, but I think that the only way we're going to really figure this problem out is, is to deal with um, a cast of thousands and um, coordinate it and, and figure out which one of these various leads are going to have traction over time. Thank you.